you're enjoying these videos or as you watch it, if you have any questions, be sure to like and subscribe and uh, post any questions you might have in the comments below and we can get back to you on it. In this episode, we're going to be talking with Paul Van Englenhoven. He is pastor of Seventh Reformed Church here and a well-known face on Pilgrim's Well. But he's going to be giving his uh, conversion testimony and then later we'll hear his call to ministry. So Paul, can you get us started with your uh, conversion testimony? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be a privilege. So um, I was born in a little town in the Netherlands, right at the center, the heart of the Netherlands. Um, I was born as a sinner, a, a little baby that a heart full of sin, even though I, uh, at that point, uh, didn't know anything but drinking, feeding, and all the rest. Um, I grew up in a Dutch Reformed home. Uh, I went to the church, which in America is more commonly known as the Free Reformed Church. Um, yeah, and as I grew up, I soon found out that uh, God existed and that God is real, but that my heart had all kinds of other desires. Uh, so I began to um, live my own way in the church. Uh, the preaching was often focused on uh, as how Christians we should live better lives, mm -hmm. um, that we were all basically Christian and that we just needed to uh, do the right thing. And, you know, at the, the right time you uh, make profession of faith and then you're settled for the rest of your life. Um, so, yeah, as I grew up, I um, made it a sport of disagreeing with my catechism teachers and try to outmaneuver them with arguments and showing that uh, they were wrong. Um, and then in my, I kind of got a group of guys that we would sit in church and, um, you know, we, we didn't take it serious at all. I soon began to, uh, the, the sin of my heart began to increase. And as I grew up, um, the sin increased and um, I became a, a bartender. Um, I was violent. I would fight with people um, in class, out of class. I would get a group of friends. Uh, we often got into fights. We would go to, we could go clubbing on Friday night, Saturday night, come home at 2 a.m., um, be still kind of morning after headache mm. um, when we be in church. But I was in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, catechism on Tuesday evenings. But um, I was as I grew up, the, the sin increased. Um, girls came into play and um, I just did whatever my heart desired. And I still thought I would go to heaven mm. because I was going to church twice on Sunday um, and I didn't live like it at all. I would... Uh, get in trouble. I would lie in school. I would lie to the principal uh, that I was under therapy for anger uh, when I pushed a teacher uh, over the table and, and things like that. I mean, I was a, a well-trained liar. They called me angel face because whenever I get in trouble, I know how to get myself out of it uh, by lies and, and looking really innocent. Uh, I was just living uh, alive, I was. I mean, I was very happy with myself. You know, I thought I had it all. I could do all my sins, uh, which I wouldn't call sins. I would call them great uh, and fantastic explorations and new desires. Um, I would have a time where I would have, you know, uh, get a new girlfriend, uh, not interesting enough. Get a new girlfriend, live like that, just following my my uh, fleshly pleasures mm. all the way uh, as much as I could. I mean, it was. When looking back, it's amazing that God didn't strike me down because I left a trail of, of blood uh, behind me, so to speak, of, of people uh, being hurt. I, I really didn't care. I would get excuses for myself why their, um, you know, why their pain is really their own fault and they should just get over it and, and not complain. Mm -hmm. um, I would be also living a life of fear in some ways. Uh, we would get in trouble. We would have a fight with someone and then I would cycle alone. I would see the guys that I'd had a fight with, but then I was alone. So I'd had to cycle another way and things like that. So it was a life of yeah, excitement, of fears, of uh, girls, of uh, later on alcohol. Um, but I never got drunk, drunk. You know, I always stopped at a certain point um, because I hated losing control. My life was about losing like keeping control of the way people looked at me, the way that nobody would dare to step on me, uh, and things like that. So it was all about control. How um, old were you, you think? Was it all like the peak of all this? 17, 16, 17, mm -hmm. I'd say. So in the Netherlands, we can drink beer earlier than in America. <coughs> so it's it's a, it opens the way. I was a bartender at, I think, the age of 15. Mm. 
So this is, this is quite young. Um, and then when I was about 17, I think 16, 17, around that time, there was an attractive girl in school and she had, uh, her parents had a camping site mm. where they would do like Christian Bible stories. Uh, and she knew that I was going to church. And so she asked me if I wanted to take a summer, take a couple of weeks and, and teach Bible with her there. And I had no interest that, I had no interest really in, in the camping, but, you know, she was an attractive girl. Um, and I went there, and then the first night, I'll never forget, uh, the people were praying, and they held hands and they prayed, and I joined, I think, okay, I know what prayer is. But then they suddenly were praying as though God was really listening. I mean, prayer to me at that point was just a, you know, you, you give Him your ideas, you, you know, your, your needs, and then you say amen. Hmm. And, you know, here I was, this seeing myself as a tough kid that, you know, we had a group of like 20 guys and stuff like that. I had it all made and suddenly I felt so overwhelmed with this, you know, what if God is really this near and this real? So I walked away from that, walked over to the camping site. I remember, I mean, I was, I was crying and I was thinking, come on, Paul, you know, this is not you. You're not a crying guy. That's the, that's the losers, you know? And, uh, that week was a strange week. There was We were hanging out with these kids, and it was a great time. Nothing developed with the girl. Um, but we had a great time. We had a group of people. And there was one boy that had ADHD. And uh, his grandmother was into Wicca. Is that what you call it here? Like witchery? Sounds, yeah. yeah. So his grandmother was into Wicca. He had ADHD. I mean, he was just... Uh, I mean, just dark, you know, he was mm. like out of control and then sad, out of control and then sad. And so I kind of felt for him. Mm. So I kind of, like I started focusing on him and he started, you know, just falling in love with, with somebody that cared for him. And at the end of that week, I went, you know, when he had to leave, I, I went on my knees, I gave him a hug and I said, I love you, buddy. And everybody started, saw that and I started crying and I thought, I never felt something like this, something so pure and so so beautiful. So I thought, okay, this is what God can do. I'm going to follow God from now on. Hmm. So I thought that was my conversion. I threw away, I had all kinds of rap music and stuff like that. I got a big bag, threw everything away, got the Bible off the shelf, starting to reading the Bible, um, started taking it really serious. <clears throat> I um, decided to go to Singapore uh, for an internship at YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Mm -hmm. I did that for three months, uh, built a, a conference program there. Um, then I went to Finland. I was, I mean, I was very zealous. Jisan, mm -hmm. uh, now my wife, she met me in that, that stage. YWAM. Um, uh, afterwards. Okay. So I went, so <laughs> my countries are kind of confusing, but I went first to Singapore, then to Finland after that for a year, mm -hmm. exchange year. And that's where I met Jisan, now my wife. But, uh, um, mm. I was so zealous. I was all about, you know, we got to spread the love of God. I mean, I was experiencing miracles, mm. uh, things that even today I would recognize as, as supernatural. For example, mm. um, at one point um, I was in Singapore. Somebody asked me to go on a trip to Myanmar, Burma. And uh, I was like, okay, I need to pray for it. So I prayed, God, you want me to go to, you know, to Myanmar? And... Um, I had the strong sense I need to go up to the top floor on the, the roof of the building. So I go to the roof of the building and a girl comes to me who is Vietnamese. And she comes to me with a card that says, I was just praying and I felt I needed to give you this. Hmm. And I look at the card and it says Myanmar. I mean, the whole card is about Myanmar. So, I mean, things like that. Uh, I have another, another story, which I mean, might be interesting. Um, I was in this conference. Uh, the preacher was praying, and then there was an offering, and the first thought in my mind is to give everything in my wallet, but I just would draw the money for the week, uh, for the end of the month. So if I would give that, I had nothing left. So I gave it, uh, let's say, $100. So I gave it into the offering. The next day, and I'm thinking, okay, I have no more food after this. The next day, a seemingly random couple, a Singaporean couple, comes to me and gives me the exact double mm -hmm. of the amount. I mean, like to the cent, the exact double. Um, and things like that. I mean, things that you cannot explain other than, I mean, you can say super coincidence or, or, you know, God moving. But I don't think I was saved at that time. I think um, I was zealous, but I didn't know Christ because I was serving him. You know, let me describe it this way. Before, I wanted to be the cool guy 
in the school with the girls. Now I wanted to be the cool Christian with the spiritual life. <clears throat> but it was just as selfish. Mm -hmm. It was just a different crowd that I tried to impress me. And it worked. I mean, in the, in the church, people were like, well, you know, you're going to mission. You know, you're using your business study, business degree for, for Christian things. This is all wonderful. Um, and so I went to Finland. But did anybody know your past and history? They thought, do they think, okay, Paul must be saved now or he was oh, yeah. saved? Or? Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, people thought I was saved. But remember, in my church, there was no emphasis on the new birth, hmm. right? It was just, you know, taking your faith seriously, and I was taking my faith seriously beyond any of my companions, huh. right? So, okay. Yeah. So then I went to Finland. So this is, so, uh, so my now wife was so confused because when she heard my testimony, it was about the miracles, about changing, about the love that I felt, but she felt there was something missing. Hmm. And... But then at the same time, she never saw somebody just quite as zealous because I would walk for two hours in minus 34 Celsius, which is kind of the equation of Fahrenheit. I think minus 34 is similar. Look it up on Google. Sure. <laughs> but it's something, it's, it's, I mean, it's super cold. Like you, you walk outside, so I would, I would be all covered in and then my eye, like my la eyelashes would start freezing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and all I wanted to do is see the power of God mm -hmm. in the snow and in the frost. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take a verse and just repeat it to myself, like a proverb, mm -hmm. re repeat it to myself for a two hour walk. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go into the forest for hours and hours to seek God. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was super zealous. I got Chinese students together and taught them the Bible. Then I gathered all the students of the of, of our year of the um, the university basically together in in one church. I invited all of them and I preached to them from Ecclesiastes. Huh. Uh, and after the after the sermon was finished, it was quiet for a couple of minutes. Like I mean, people were just stunned at the the, the brevity of life and the importance of uh, mm -hmm. finding God. Uh, so I was so convinced that I was a true Christian, mm. uh, and I was so happy in how impressive my Christianity was. I mean, I was constantly looking for more ways to show zeal. Um, and yet, my friend, uh, now my wife, she was like, I think you need to watch this. <laughs> I think you need to do this. I think you need to do this. I'm like, why? What is that? Yeah, I don't think you, like, you, you, I don't think you... Yeah, I don't want to say. <laughs> she was very <laughs> careful, but she was trying to find a way. But at that time, her she was shy to speak. And so we had Bible studies with her, with me, and then a Catholic uh, boy, man from Poland. So, I mean, we were the only three people that, that claimed they believe in God. This is in Finland. This is in Finland. Okay. Yeah. So I, I spent the whole year eating very little food or, or spending very little money to save up money to go on a trip for two and a half months to, to Cambodia. Mm. So, I mean, that, that just added to my zeal, right? Who does that? Right. Who spends $10, $12 a week on groceries just buying rice, chicken, and, and bread to, to go on a mission trip? Mm. So I thought, I mean, this must be God. Mm. So I did that. And then in between, so we had a two-month trip to Cambodia. And then I had two more months free because the, the Finnish year only is eight years in school, eight months in school. Mm -hmm. So I had four months. So I took two months to go to the trip in Cambodia. And I'm there, and I mean, it's, I'm just growing in my confidence, in my Christianity. I'm, I mean, I'm so bold. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on the other side of the world. I'm seeing people that have never seen a white person before, and I'm bringing them like, like money and like support, and I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. Hmm. And suddenly there's this, this missionary lady who, who's single, adopted seven children, runs two organizations. I mean, she is just a powerhouse. Hmm. Um, of serving the Lord. And she says, Paul, you're five days working for a microfinance. Uh, then you spend the day Sunday in the church, but Saturday you hang out with the missionary kids and just do your own stuff. Why do you not spend that time with the people of the church and try to encourage them? Hmm. And I was thinking of that. And I mean, this is, you know, it's just advice and just a way, you know, you're here only for a short time. Why don't you do this? But as she said that, suddenly it's like, like it exposes me. Hmm. And I began to think, well, why does God not speak to me? Hmm. Right? Why does the Holy Spirit not convict me of these things? I'm, I was reading scripture. I'm reading of the Holy Spirit. I was listening to people like Ravenhill and Paul Washer and, and these different preachers that talked about the new birth hmm. and, and you know, transformation. And I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever been changed. Hmm. Right? I've changed externally, but internally I'm 
Hmm. I'm still the same selfish desires. Hmm. Why, why do, does a person need to point that out? Why is the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Then I started thinking, I don't think the Holy Spirit has ever convicted me of a sin other than I read something and I tried to do it. Hmm. And so I'm starting to think through the New Testament. I said, well, there's this spiritual life, this new life, but I don't have that. All I have done is changed externally. Um, and if I was honest, I didn't love the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I loved the religion called Christianity mm -hmm. and the honor that was found in there, but I didn't love Christ. So I, was, I went to my home uh, there, and it was right next to the Genocide Museum. I mean, mm -hmm. this is probably the worst place in Cambodia, right? This is where all the people were killed mm -hmm. by, you know, by gas and poisoning and stuff like that. So I'm, 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 I'm literally across the street, you know, mm -hmm. 10 yards away from the building. I'm sitting there, and I, I, at that point, I say, Lord, and I said to myself, I'm, I'm leaving this room in a casket or as a new man, mm. but I'm not going to leave this room unless I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, shut the door. Okay, what do you do? You know, there's nothing, like I always said, there's no buttons, like new birth push here. You know, so I think, what do I do? So, I, you know, I heard about praying and confessing your sins. Okay, I'll, I'll confess my sin. I go through my past. And I mean, I spent probably an hour trying to think of every sin I could remember and just confess it, just the most vile things and everything else. And I confess it. I, I lay it out all. Oh, that doesn't change anything. Okay, I'll weep over it. You know, so I stir up my heart and look at how terrible this is and, and how wrong this is and mm. nothing changes. Okay, I need to believe in God. So I, you know, I screen my eyes, try to believe in God. Nothing changes. Mm. And I get desperate and I'm so exhausted. You know, I'm like two hours in now. And I, like, what do you do? Mm. You know, it's like, is it too late? Mm. You know, is it, have I missed it? Mm. So finally, I'm in exhaustion. I started listening to sermons. And it's interesting that you said Paul Washer. So I started listening to Paul Washer's <laughs> sermons. Uh, and it's a series called The True Gospel. Mm. I think if there's anything that I need to hear, I need to hear the gospel. I, I mean, I, I grew up in church. I know that the gospel is what's supposed to bring you to salvation. So he starts, he begins with, uh, I'm preaching this to help you love God more. I'm like, well, you know, the first beginning of love would be nice. <laughs> but uh, he says, I'm going to be hard because then you can love God more. I think, well, I mean, yeah, I hope you're going to be hard enough. Mm. You know? And he starts explaining how utterly sinful we are and how utterly righteous God is. Mm. I mean, it caught me mm. off guard completely because he was describing that our heart is a cesspool. Mm. And I had no idea what a cesspool was. <laughs> but the way he said the word cesspool, it sounded really awful. <laughs> I think I only knew what cesspool was like a couple of months ago. But anyway, so he's, and in my mind, as I'm listening to the sermon, I'm, you know, at the, by the end of it, I listened to three hours of sermons. Mm. But this must have been like an hour and a half in or something like that. Um, and I, to me, it's almost like he just keeps repeating the same thing. Your heart is successful. Your heart is successful. Your heart is successful. And I'm beginning to realize it's not something I need to do or something needs to change or something I need to wash on the outside. My heart is successful. Mm. Like I am a sin factory that mm. produces evil and mm. wickedness. And as he's preaching, I come to the realization that there is no hope for me. You know, there, it's over. And I didn't pray this out loud, but in my heart, I said, okay, take me home mm. to hell mm. because that's what I deserve. You know, you're right. You're holy. You're righteous. I'm evil. Just send me to hell. I don't want to sin against your name anymore. Mm. And um, that should have been the end, you know. He should have taken me to hell and then it would all make sense. But then he, um, he opened a new, hmm. I clicked a new video, and uh, audio I think it was, and I started listening and he, he read this in uh, Isaiah 53 verse 10. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. And the preacher begins to explain that Jesus was crushed mm. for my cesspool, for my sin. And that 
he exchanged his righteousness for for my cesspool. Mm. And he died with my cesspool upon the cross. And and that I received perfectly that perfect righteousness, the perfect holiness. When he said that, I was free. Mm. I, I was clean. I mean, that was it. Mm. You know, I it wasn't a like a choice or I need to turn or so. When I heard that, mm. it was new. Mm. I mean, I I literally jumped up in my room and I started praising God. Mm-hmm. I, the whole, everything was gone. You know, the the last drop of the cesspool was drained. Every, it was perfectly clean. Mm-hmm. I knew at that moment I could walk into the holy presence of God where mm-hmm. angels cover their eyes and stand and praise God. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that mm-hmm. that changed everything and it's and so what changed was not the outside it was the inside yeah. you know it, yes it had its fruit outside but the inside changed suddenly i was worshiping god from the heart it wasn't about glorifying god or doing something great or being seen by men mm. but i said lord i want to clean a toilet for you in the smallest church somewhere in the world you know like, just anything just serving you is a privilege mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, it's, hmm. and it's amazing because uh, the next day I went to this missionary's home uh, or the office and I walked in and he says, what happened to you? <laughs> I mean, he, my eyes were different, you know, <laughs> I, could, I, I looked different. I was just filled with joy. And he looked at me and he says, well, you were a Christian before, but now you're a kingdom Christian. And I mean, I said, no, 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 I was dead yesterday. I'm alive today. Hmm. And, and, you know, I went, you know, so where do you, so I come back. I had two months of time. What do I do? Hmm. I got to know this word. So I spent the next two months reading the Bible, but then I got so excited because I got to pray. So I went out. My parents lived by the fields. So I went out into the fields. I prayed, and I, I don't know what to pray anymore. So I went back, and I read the Bible, and that's, that's two months. You know, I, I just wanted to know him and see him and walk with him, and I wanted to know the Savior hmm. that saved me. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I went to all, so I, what church do you go, you know, because I, I came from a church that never preached a new birth. So I came back and I started talking to them about Christ. I went to the young people that we used to make full, like, you know, f- make fun of the church. Mm. I asked them, I said, you need to be born again. You need to be saved. You need to come to know Christ. Mm. And, uh, mm. you know, I mean, this is kind of sad, but they pushed me out of the church because you're setting, you're upsetting the faith of the young people. But I mean, I, sure, if you want me to go somewhere else, I go somewhere else. You know, and I, I had to talk about Christ with everyone and this, this new life that is found. I started listening. Uh, I mean, this is, this is an interesting part, but uh, I started listening to people like Todd Bentley. Hmm. Really? Todd Bentley is a guy that uh, wears a Harley Davidson suit and tries to kick cancer out of people with his biker boot. I mean, this is... Uh, <laughs> But I mean, I'm, he's, he says God is powerful, and I knew a powerful God. So I thought, but maybe he's right. So I'm li- he's got like two hour messages, hour and 45 messages. So I'm outside in the fields at night, I'm listening to him, and suddenly it's like, like a conviction in my heart this is not from God. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the scriptures, but this is not from God. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I turn it off, delete everything, never go back to there, you know, and that whole group. Much later, I found out that nothing what he said is really from God's word, and he doesn't know God at all, and the power that he says is not mm-hmm. God's power. Yeah. But God protected me. You know? And as I began to understand Scripture better, then I, I began to discern what was right. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that's, the, the Lord changed my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's what true conversion is. It's the life of God and the soul of man, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a change from the inside out as well. Well, thank you, Paul, for sharing that testimony and uh, look forward to joining you again to talk about your call to ministry. Thank you again for joining us on Pilgrim's Well. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Look forward to joining you again next time. Thanks. Thanks.